Hello, welcome back to Struggling with a Stupid Corroding Solar Panel Part 2. And while that's not exactly the name of this series, it's pretty much what the first part ended up being, so this video won't make much sense to you if you didn't watch the first part. And also, completely off topic, the workshop's a total mess right now, because I took apart a treadmill and haven't quite figured things out just yet. Anyway, back to the solar panel. Did baking it in an oven at 50 degrees celsius for 48 hours do the job? Well, nope. I put these blobs of the caulking material there as samples before I put it in the oven, and as you can see it's still soft and squishy even though it's now like 3 days after I pulled it out of the oven, and if I dissect it, it's still quite a little bit lighter on the inside than it is on the outside. Truth be told, I don't trust this stuff anymore. I'll just redo the entire thing, and I'm gonna make it short since I'm pretty sure you're just as sick of this matter as I am. So here we go. Well, I just popped off one of the end caps, and here's our first surprise. It's still completely wet. I mean, who the hell thought it would be a good idea to invent a caulking material which does not dry? Tell them to go eat their cock! I'm taking everything apart again, even going as far as to remove the protective plastic film on the back from all corrosion infected areas. Then I cover these areas with orange PVC tape, wrapping it around the edge and onto the front side of the panel. To hopefully make sure no water gets underneath the tape, I'm sealing all the seams with super glue. Once all edges and corners of the panel are nicely wrapped and sealed, I can put it back together like it originally was, albeit being kind of careful not to puncture the tape. Then I can cut off all excess of tape on the front side of the panel and seal those seams to the glass as well. And now I'm going to use real silicone caulk to make a seal between the glass of the panel and the aluminum frame, so most of the water should get deflected and doesn't even start seeping into the rubber gasket. Well, that should be it. Now, before I put it outside again, I'm gonna solder a ribbon cable, which I got from an old printer, to the end of this wire here, and that's actually gonna allow us to get the electricity inside without drilling a hole into the window frame. If you don't have a ribbon cable, that's not a big deal, because you can easily make your own by simply sandwiching a few thin wires between two layers of tape. Since ribbon cables are usually designed to carry data and not current, I'm going to combine 8 of the strands on either side, leaving the two middle strands unused so I can't accidentally short it out with a blob of solder. To connect the other side, I'll actually reuse the very same connector the ribbon cable originally plugged into. That'll allow me to remove the solar panel for maintenance later on, without having to bother about also removing the electronics or the battery. And to waterproof the outdoor connection, I'm gonna cover it in a thick layer of paint. Oh wait, actually, for continuity purposes, I'll do the indoors connector as well. Perfect, with the panel reattached, I can get the wiring sorted out. I'm simply going to zip tie the cable to this eye bolt, which theoretically, again, the shutter should hook into to keep it closed. But like I said in the last video, nobody ever closes this shutter, so there's no reason not to use this eye bolt for different purposes. And also, while I'm at it, I should probably point out that this window faces southwest, so I always get an afternoon worth of sunlight on the panel. Now, sticking the ribbon cable to the profile of the window frame using double-sided tape isn't strictly necessary, but I'll do it anyways. Now, the only thing left to do on the inside is plugging the other cable into the ribbon cable and fixing it to the wall with a small piece of plastic and a nail. So we've got the solar panel outside, and the cable goes up and inside through the window, where I routed it down behind this plant shelf, and to the left, where it goes up again and plugs nicely into the electronics, which don't even exist yet. But as you can see from this LED, it's putting out power right now. We're finally ahead of where we were at 6 minutes in on the last episode. I think it's time to select the components we're gonna need for the electronics, and then comes the not-so-fun part, and that is 
coding because I'm kind of bad at coding even if it's only on Arduino but I always end up inventing projects that require much higher programming skills than I actually have. So in reality my programming skills are going to decide whether I can build this thing like I imagined it or whether I'll have to cut it down a notch or two. Anyway, first of all I'm gonna need a Pro Mini and instead of using a new one I'm obviously gonna rip this one out of a project which incidentally also failed because of my lack of programming skills. Instead of using the LCD I said I'll use, I'm gonna switch to this OLED which I've never even tried to work with before because unlike the LCD, the OLED runs on 3.3 volts, just like the Pro Mini and I need the same logic level on both. Then I need this small MOSFET to cut off the charging once the battery has reached a certain voltage, two metal film resistors for a voltage divider, a shunt resistor to measure the charging current, the buck regulator itself and a switch to turn it on or off. Now to the really important parts. I need a green LED to display whenever it's charging and a yellow one to show if the buck converter is running. Maybe a blue one should light up when the battery is fully charged and a red one if it's depleted. That's pretty much all generic colors of LEDs as well as all the most important components. While there will be more components overall, I'll talk about those later once everything works and I'll show you the schematic. Now it's just putting everything together on a breadboard and then days and days of trying to figure out how to get the Arduino to do the stuff I wanted to do. Well, I'll be off and try to get it to do anything. The good thing for you is you won't even notice anything. I'll just reappear through this door and everything will be magically working. Or maybe not. Anyway, see you in an instant, probably a week later. Day 4 Sorry, I couldn't get through the door because it's not yet working. One week to get it done was incredibly optimistic. Actually, I've spent four days trying to figure it out with the only results being that first I had to rig up an entire prototype of the circuit on this piece of cardboard because the connections on the breadboard were so incredibly bad that it wouldn't even give me remotely similar voltage readings on a constant voltage. Then I managed to blow up the voltage regulator on the Arduino, that's this little guy here, and the original shunt resistor. And now I'm pretty much stuck because the code doesn't work and apparently the circuit I've been using all this time isn't functional either. So I'm quite sorry I'll have to call it quits for this video now, but I'd much rather not have a half finished video lying around for months until I can get this done. So I'll just finish it now and upload it. You'll have something to watch and I'll do a different video and work on this stupid thing in the background. <laughs> Sorry, bye. Oh, and yes, I'm fully aware that what I'm trying to build I can basically buy for under 7 bucks on AliExpress, but why buy when you can DIY? And also, it looks kind of nasty to be honest. Mine's gonna be much nicer. Whatever. <laughs> if you want to help me with the code, here's my Reddit and I read all the comments on the video, so hit me up.